Welcome to the Racial Foundations of Public Policy Speaker Series hosted by the Center for Racial Justice at the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. I am Celeste Watkins Hayes, Director of the Center, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the Ford School and a Professor of Public Policy and Sociology. At the Ford School, we seek a world in which people are able to achieve their full human potential regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, class, and other categories that have been used to divide and systematically marginalize people. We train leaders here who understand the critical role of public policy in improving our world. We recognize the power of public policy to bolster or to undercut our life opportunities and experiences, and we see public policy as a critically important tool for us to measure, reflect, historically examine, and help us define the way forward. At the Center for Racial Justice, we seek to illuminate evidence-based solutions to address deep challenges around racial inequity and to support the change makers who advocate for sound, just, and fair public policies. We take an intersectional approach, seeking to expand knowledge and highlight strategies and tools that address the complex intersections between public policy and racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, classism, xenophobia, and other societal problems. As we examine the fraught histories and consequences of some of our policies and the transformative power of others, we learn a valuable lesson. Effective and just public policy can only be achieved if we bring diverse perspectives to the table. This fall, the center is featuring a cadre of scholars to participate in virtual conversations on the historical roots and contemporary currents of race in economic, criminal justice, education, and immigration policy. We encourage you to review our website at the Center for Racial Justice for the dates of those events. Our next Racial Foundations of Public Policy event will be on Tuesday, October 26th at 4 p.m. and will feature education scholar, Dr. Rutger Johnson from UC Berkeley. But now I'm delighted and honored to introduce you to the third speaker for our inaugural Center for Racial Justice Racial Foundations series, Dr. William Sandy Darity, Jr. Dr. Darity is the Samuel Du Bois Cook Professor of Public Policy, African and African American Studies and Economics, and the director of the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. He served as the, as the chair of the Department of African and African American Studies and was the founding director of the Research Network on Racial and Ethnic Inequality at Duke. Dr. Darity's research focuses on inequality by race, class and ethnicity, stratification economics, schooling and the racial achievement gap, north-south theories of trade and development, skin shade and labor market outcomes, the economics of reparations, the Atlantic slave trade and the industrial revolution, the history of economics and the social psychological effects of exposure to unemployment. His most recent book, co-authored with A. Kirsten Mullen, is From Here to Eternity, Equality, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. From Here to Equality is the recipient of the inaugural 2021 Book Prize from the Association of Ameri African American Life and History and the 2020 Reagan Old North State Award for Nonfiction from the North Carolina Literary and Historical Association. Dr. Darity, you have an illustrious career. We are so, so honored to have you here. I could not imagine launching a Racial Foundations of Public Policy series without you. And I mean that sincerely. So it is my honor to be in conversation with you today. Well, you're extremely generous, but this is a mutual admiration society. I've been a tremendous fan of the work that you have done uh, for, for many, many years. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So as an economist, you focus on the historical roots and contemporary disparities related to income and wealth inequality. And one of the hallmarks of your work is as an economist, you nevertheless have a deeply historical perspective to understand contemporary issues. Why is such a lens important? Well, I, I, I frequently say that the most important field of study is history. Mm. Uh, and, and the reason I, I think that is because it informs everything that we do, not only 
in the academic world, but also in terms of our real lives. Uh, and so I, I guess some people would say our academic lives are real lives, but there is a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's particularly important in a society where there has been such an extensive degree of dishonesty mm -hmm. about what the historical record actually is. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a severe degree of domination of the American narrative by organizations like the United Daughters of the Confederacy and the Daughters of the American Revolution. And this results in the long term in uh, a set of beliefs and attitudes that can, uh, can cause people to invade the nation's capital and to try to execute a coup d'etat as mm -hmm. what happened on January 6th. And so uh, I think that the contestation over the field of history is absolutely critical. And it's, it's vital that we design and develop the most accurate story that we can tell about what has happened uh, in the generations that came before us. Um, and I think that uh, a serious economist can't really do uh, useful work about uh, public policy, about social change, unless they attempt to develop a very serious understanding of the accurate historical record. Mm -hmm. And so much of that historical framework is so useful in policy analysis. When I think about my own work on the welfare system, I couldn't understand what was happening with welfare reform as under the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, unless I looked at that long history of the system. I couldn't understand the building of an HIV safety net and infrastructure without understanding the history of that system. And you have done so much work trying to understand income and wealth from a historical perspective and to try to understand what have been some of the major policies that have been critical when we look at income and wealth disparities today. Walk us through that. We I use the term policy genealogy. Mm. Walk us through that nice. kind of policy genealogy when we think about income and wealth inequality. What have well, been some of the key policies? So so I think that you know historically until until the period of the New Deal, uh American public policy largely focused on what I would like to refer to as asset building strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, from the New Deal onward, there was a much greater emphasis on what I'd like to refer to as income supplements. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important uh, in, in the context of, of, uh, of thinking about this idea that you just mentioned of policy genealogy, uh, to recognize the points at which different types of changes took place uh, in, in the, the nature of the policies that the, uh, the federal government in the United States has pursued. Um, so if we go back to the uh, 19th century, to the period of the end of the Civil War, the federal government was primarily in an asset building mode. And the central asset that was being provided to Americans and to recent immigrants who were not yet necessarily Americans, uh, these are white immigrants from, from, uh, from Europe primarily, um, was land. Uh, mm -hmm. Land was the central asset that the federal government was essentially handing out. Uh, and it was handing out land that had been appropriated from the native population in the United States. Uh, uh, a population that was displaced from their own uh, their own territories and uh, and removed to other locations. Um, in fact, uh, it, it's it's the period in which uh, we in the early part of the of the nineteenth century. It's the period in which so-called uh, Indian territory is created in what is now modern day Oklahoma, uh, but. Um, but in that process, the federal government uh, in 1862 introduces a Homestead Act. And the Homestead Act uh, created provisions for 160 acres land grants to be given to, uh, to families. And approximately one and a half million white families received those, uh, those land grants. Wow. Uh, you know, your colleague, uh, uh, Trina Williams-Shanks has done 
a substantial amount of work on the Homestead Act and probably the, uh, the foremost expert on the long-term impact of the Homestead Act. And I think she estimates that at least 45 million living white Americans are beneficiaries of the Homestead Act across the generations. So, so the first the first asset that's being provided to Americans for the purposes of giving them wealth is is land. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the promise of forty acre land grants, one quarter of the size of the allocations that were provided to white Americans, the promise of forty acre land grants to the formerly enslaved as restitution for their years of bondage was never met. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in the 20th century, uh, for a substantial period of time, the, the government's asset building focus was on home ownership instead of on land. And there were a number of policies, including those that were introduced during the course of the New Deal, uh, that were intended to promote, uh, to promote home buying or opportunities for home buying. And, and this is the way in which the nation uh, created a substantial degree of upward mobility for many of its citizens and created a middle class. But it did so in such a way that it disproportionately benefited white Americans in, in a very stark and dramatic way. Uh, the New Deal legislation that's relevant, perhaps the most important piece of New Deal legislation, is associated with the creation of the Federal Housing Administration. The Federal Housing Administration, in conjunction with local banks, uh, crafted a public-private partnership that engaged in a process of what I'd like to refer to as credit starvation mm -hmm. towards Black Americans mm -hmm. and credit generation for white Americans uh, that facilitated uh, the, the white American community's capacity to become home buyers on an extensive scale in homes that were likely to appreciate significantly mm -hmm. over time, while uh, the black community had restricted access to that credit and consequently to the extent that uh, folks were able to purchase homes, they had to buy homes in, in neighborhoods uh, where appreciation was, was less likely. Um, and then the final significant phase of this asset building orientation is the GI Bill, uh, mm. which is enacted in the aftermath of, uh, of World War II, which had provisions to support returning veterans in going to college, uh, getting vocational training, uh, purchasing a farm, uh, investing in a business, and then perhaps most significantly from the standpoint of 20th century asset building policies, purchasing homes. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, this was done on a highly discriminatory basis. Uh, I've seen estimates that indicate that out of some uh, 65,000 veterans that received uh, uh, benefits uh, in the states of New York and New Jersey, only 100 or so were black with respect to the home buying benefits. And then in Mississippi, out of about uh, 3,500 returning veterans, who received home buying benefits, only two were black. And so uh, there was a real asymmetry in the execution of this program that led to or contributed to the kinds of wealth disparities we observe today. And I guess my, my final comment in this, this genealogy is to say that in the aftermath of the 1950s, much of federal policy has shifted away from a focus on asset building towards, uh, exclusively towards income supplements. Mm. Um, and as a consequence, uh, there has been uh, a perpetuation of this divide in wealth because uh, income supplement initiatives don't have much to do in terms of affecting uh, the levels of wealth in, in, in families and in households. Mm -hmm. And what would you, what are examples of income supplement programs? Are you thinking about, are you defining those as safety net programs or is that something else? No, I, I'm thinking of safety net programs and right. there's a wide range of them. Welfare, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the change in welfare from what we once knew it as. 
uh, so it went from AFDC to uh, to the program that you mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. but both in both cases, those are income supplements. Unemployment insurance is a form of an income supplement. Mm -hmm. uh, food stamps uh, are are a form of uh, of, of an income supplement, an in-kind supplement, effectively. So uh, we, we have a set of programs that are in place, and, and as you describe them, they're safety net programs uh, that are intended to assist people who fall into poverty. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the key thing is that these are programs that respond only after you have fallen into poverty. We do not have a social apparatus, uh, a social policy apparatus to prevent people from experiencing poverty in the first place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the sense that in, in many of our social welfare programs, the fire has to be raging before we install the fire extinguisher. Right? Yeah, and they're, they're, they're means tested. And that right. means that right. you have to demonstrate that your income has fallen below a certain level before you're eligible to receive the benefits of those programs. Right. Would you imagine adding a fourth phase in this conversation about land and housing, the GI Bill, income, income supplements, I guess I would say a fifth phase, and that is the role of say tax policy. Um, yeah, that, that's, 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 that's very, very important. Yeah, um, and, what, yeah. and what would you say about that in terms of how that, reproduces inequity in terms of who's paying what, but also how people are able to navigate that system based on the kinds of resources that they have. Well, I, I, as you know, uh, the, the law professor Dorothy Brown has an excellent book that is on precisely this topic in terms of addressing the racial impact of tax policy. Uh, and the book is called The Whiteness of Wealth, and I encourage uh, folks to take a look at it. Uh, but uh, you know, I, my thinking is uh, it's only in the context of tax policy that we still have a substantial set of initiatives that the federal government is utilizing to promote asset building. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's promoting asset building for folks who are already wealthy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and whereas the idea behind uh, the Homestead Act of 1862, the idea behind the GI Bill, was to promote wealth accumulation among those who did not necessarily have it already. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that's a very different set of policies, but there's a number of mechanisms in the tax system that actually enhance the wealth position of the already affluent. And, and one of the, the, the classic examples is the sacred cow in the tax system, which is the home mortgage deduction. Mm. Okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, 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 the greater the value of your home, the more you benefit from the home mortgage deduction. Right, right, which is already kind of perpetuating wealth in a lot of ways in terms of who gets rewarded for having resources. Yeah. So when we go back in time, and I want to go back to um, what you call kind of a, a golden age, a mystic age, and I, I, I try to think about when have policies been proactive about responding to wealth and income disparities? When have they held the greatest promise, um, even if the implementation met challenges? When were the moments that we were truly imaginative in terms of income and wealth um, any responding to income and, and wealth inequality. And you write in your book, From Here to Equality, about, I think you called it the mystic era. Uh, um, no, the seven no, it's, mystic it's, actually, it's actually borrowed from W.E.B. Du Bois, and it is uh, the seven mystic years. The seven mystic years. And it always comes back to Du Bois, doesn't it? I mean, Nicole <laughs> with us a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, or I mean, last yeah. week, I think we talked about her yeah, whether grounding. Whether it's double party. consciousness or the third right, eye, right. Yeah, it always exactly. comes back to the grounding of so many of her core concepts and understanding of, of criminal justice policy in the understanding of Du Bois. So talk to us about Du Bois' conception of the seven mystic years. What, what was that era? Tell us about it. And do you see that as the era of the uh, when we had the most promise and had done the most in terms of proactively addressing wealth and income. 
if okay. if you're talking about inequality between blacks and whites, okay. yes, yeah. absolutely. That that is the only period in which the prospect for true democracy in the United States was actually pursued. Okay. And okay. when I say true democracy, I mean including or incorporating uh, the formerly enslaved or what we now refer to as the freedmen um, into the national polity as full citizens. Right, and uh, otherwise known as reconstruction. That so is tell the us reconstruction era, yeah. Tell us what the Reconstruction era meant for wealth and income equality. We've talked about in previous um, masterclass, I mean, uh, racial foundations conversations about its impact for political participation for black lawmakers. But so much of Reconstruction was about economic incorporation. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. And, and that was the other side of Reconstruction that was... Uh, was 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 a failed aspect of reconstruction which was the the whole issue of the provision of land the the the, the vaunted 40 acres yeah uh, you know which which was promised to the freedmen uh, there was an expectation that the freedmen held based upon what they were told what policymakers were saying that uh, that Every uh, every family would receive, or or household of four would receive the equivalent of forty acre land grants. And so, since there were four million uh, newly emancipated persons in the United States, uh, at minimum there was an expectation of an allocation of forty million acres. Mm -hmm. And uh, what differentiates the potential allocations to uh, to the freedmen from the allocations that were made under the Homestead Act is that the immediate previous owners of the land or possessors of the land that was supposed to go to the freedmen were the former slaveholders, hmm. whereas the land that was allocated under the Homestead Act was land from which the indigenous Americans had just shortly before been displaced. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a, a sense of justice that was associated with the notion that the land that folks had worked under coercion should revert to them as their property, as their, uh, as their source of wealth. Uh, and, and that didn't occur. Uh, mm -hmm. The process was begun with uh, General Sherman's Special Field Orders Number 15, which provided for initially an allocation of 5.3 million acres of land stretching from the sea islands of South Carolina to northern Florida, bounded by the St. Johns River. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, an initial allocation that was specified in, in, in General Sherman's special field order number 15. People frequently say that, uh, mistakenly think that the allocation was 400,000 acres. Uh, but it was actually 5.3 million. What, what, what uh, the, the 400,000 acres was the amount of land that actually was settled mm -hmm. by 40,000 of the freedmen before President Andrew Johnson uh, abrogated the program altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, so, so that's the lost promise of, of the Reconstruction era. But the other side of the lost promise, as you mentioned, is uh, the failure to uh, maintain and sustain full participation by the freedmen in the electoral process. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's a consequence of outright violence and, ter and terror on the part of uh, the former Confederates. Uh, and you know, one might even say that they really weren't former Confederates because they were still pursuing the Confederate project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I think it's also when we talk about conversations around income and wealth, we also have to talk about debt and the kind of systematic debt creation that happens after this era through systems of sharecropping and other economic practices that render uh, black folks in particular constantly in debt to, um, to white landowners. Can, can you talk about 
what the legacy of that is and, and of that. Well, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I've actually heard people say things like, if you could eliminate student loan debt, you would eliminate the racial wealth gap. And this, this is absolutely inaccurate. Uh, certainly the question of debt uh, disparities is an important one, but we have to recognize that actually the average level of debt that's held by white Americans is higher than the average level of debt that's held by black Americans. Mm -hmm. What's the critical difference is black Americans have considerably fewer assets. So that if we were just to do a simple accounting exercise on the nature of the racial wealth gap in the United States, we would find that the, the greater differential in wealth is attributable to an asset gap rather than to a debt gap. And so if you were to reduce or eliminate certain significant categories of debt, and student loan debt is only one category of debt, uh, you certainly could make some progress towards eliminating or reducing the racial wealth gap. But unless you address the asset differential, you're really not going to be able to, to close that gap in any significant way. And how have scholars improved the ways in which they understand the racial wealth gap? You know, there was a time where we, it, was, it was easier to be able to discern the income gap, and therefore it was really the focus of so many of our policy conversations, of our research, it was all about income inequality. And people had an awareness that there was wealth inequality, but there was always a question of measurement. How do you measure? Can you talk to us about how we have improved the techniques by which we're able to make these claims around the, the racial wealth gap? Yeah, so the, 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 there are data sets now that are available. And I think uh, the first point at which uh, micro data on wealth uh, was, was, was initially generated in the United States on a national scale was, uh, was, was through the Survey of Consumer Finances. And I believe the first round of the Survey of Consumer Finances occurs either in the late 50s or the early 1960s. Uh, we, we also have the panel study of income dynamics, which provides us with uh, excellent data about, about wealth inequality, as well as other aspects of, uh, of, of uh, intergenerational, uh, intergenerational transmission effects, which are, are extremely, extremely important. Uh, but, you know, interestingly enough, I think it's uh, a couple of uh, scholars in your field who uh, played an important role in shifting attention to wealth uh, mm -hmm. in such a way that people finally began to recognize that it was something that was different from income and that it had uh, very, very different uh, consequences for the quality of people's lives and their opportunity. And I'm, I'm thinking of the work of Melvin Oliver and Tom Shapiro uh, yeah. and their book, Black Wealth, White Wealth. Uh, I think that was somewhat of a landmark in terms of establishing that uh, paying attention to wealth uh, had a different set of implications from paying attention to income. Right, right. And one of the things that is so important for many of our um, students who are watching this is when we talk about wealth inequality, so often there are things that we don't necessarily recognize as replicators of inequity, right? Our parents may pay for our college tuition and leave us debt free. Um, they may help for a down payment in for a house. They may, right. you know, they may give you a car. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so, they, so they may they may send you to a summer enrichment camp that gives you a jump on doing chemistry or doing physics as a high school student, and then that gives you access to uh, a, a more Tony college or university. And then, if your parents have the resources, they can make sure that you emerge from college without any of the student debt that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, th those are all ways that I think we we tend to overlook or underestimate as factors that contribute to the perpetuation of these types of differences in wealth uh, across racial lines, but also across individuals. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you've been very active in is to think about solutions to this. And from here to equality really puts forth an argument, a proposal for how we begin to systematically address these inequities. Because I can imagine a student who's watching this to say, well, should I refuse the down payment? Should I refuse the assistance of my parents and all of that if I wanna make a difference? And what you're arguing is that these dynamics are systemic and therefore we need systemic solutions. So can you talk to us about the, the premise? Yeah, and and, and I, I don't think individuals should be plagued by the equivalent of survivor's guilt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Th this is not a question of guilt. This is how the society has operated for multiple generations. Mm -hmm. And so there needs to be a societal intervention to try to address the kinds of inequalities that have been produced. Uh, and they've been produced in large measure by public policy. Right. So if, if they're a product of public policy, whether it's the Homestead Act or the practices of the Federal Housing Administration or the GI Bill, uh, then it suggests that we need uh, we need we need public policy to come into uh, come into play to try to address those kinds of inequalities. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there there are two tiers of inequality and wealth that need to be tackled. Mm -hmm. uh, one tier is what we might refer to as overall or general inequality and wealth, and in that context, I've worked uh, with uh, with with, with some other scholars to try to design a plan that we refer to now as the baby bonds proposal mm. as, a, as a way of trying to uh, address uh, overall wealth inequality. And, and the idea there is that every newborn infant would be provided with a trust account that they could access when they reach young adulthood, but the amount of the trust account would vary depending upon the wealth position of the child's family. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, if, 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 if it was Bill Gates who had another child, then we'd give them a token trust account of $50. Mm -hmm. But for children born in the lowest end of the wealth distribution, then their trust accounts would be in the vicinity of fifty to $60,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this would be a way of, of, creating greater equality and wealth if you measure the wealth gap at the median, at the middle of the wealth distribution. Mm -hmm. And that's the premise behind the baby bonds proposal. But in, in the pages of From Here to Equality, we are concerned with the racial wealth gap. Mm -hmm. uh, and we argue that if you're going to be concerned about the racial wealth gap, you have to focus on the differential in wealth at the mean or what people customarily think about in, intuitively as the average mm -hmm. rather than the median. Now, and why do I say that? You know, recognizing that if you're looking at the middle of the distribution, it's, it's not contaminated by the outlying values, either at the upper end or the lower end. Uh, which is which is what motivates people to think about the median rather than the mean. But in this context, I think we have to consider the mean rather than the median. We have to take into account the outlying values. And here's why. First, 97% of the wealth that is held by white American households is held by those households that have a net worth above the white median. So if you were to take the middle household in the white distribution of wealth, 50% of the households above them, the half that's above them, mm -hmm. have 97% of the white wealth. Wow. So if you were to look only at the median household, you would be ignoring a vast amount of the wealth that is held in white households. Now, folks frequently say, well, you know, that's only because there's a handful of extraordinarily rich white billionaires. Well, it's true that there's only a handful, uh, there, there, there is a handful of extraordinarily rich white billionaires, but that doesn't fully explain the, dis the discrepancy that I just mentioned. It, 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 it runs deeper 
than just the billionaires or millionaires. Mm -hmm. uh, one quarter, one quarter of white households has a net worth in excess of one million dollars, mm -hmm. and it's one only quarter. Four, one quarter, yeah. and it's only four percent of black households. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so the disparity is not exclusively due to the fact that there's just a few extraordinarily rich white billionaires. Right. That's throwing off the whole distribution. Yeah. 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 So your uh, solution or proposal in here to um, equality has to do with reparations. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But I want to go back to the baby bonds idea, because I think it's very intriguing and part of what you're suggesting is an approach of what we might call targeting via universalism. The idea of imagining a public policy that targets all and, a pro and is in a universal pro public policy for all, but, but targets marginalized communities within it. Um, why do you think that approach of targeting within a universal policy approach, the idea that everybody gets the baby bond, even, you know, Bill Gates' child get the, gets the baby bond, even if it's not the same amount. Why do you think that that is important from a kind of, I imagine, a, I imagine you're thinking about positive policy feasibility, and I, I would love for you to talk about that. Well, I think there's also a statement of principle that the society is saying that every child has a right to some initial endowment of resources to mm -hmm. launch them. Okay. And uh, so it's a universal program, but it's not uniform in the sense that not every child that's born will need the same amount of resources to give them a jump start in the wealth accumulation process when they become young adults. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, the the idea is that this this is a component of a package of what we might actually call an economic bill of rights for the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's treated as something that is universal, that it's applicable to all children. It, but but the important dimension of it is not not all children would receive exactly the same amount. Mm -hmm. And have you seen a policy that have you seen proposals where people have taken this up? Do you have you seen policies that begin to move in that direction? Do we have anything to be optimistic about in terms of people moving in the direction of that kind of conversation? Yeah, um, uh, you know, in a way, it's unfortunate, but much more so than talking about a substantive program of reparations. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I want to emphasize. The premise in my my thinking is that these are not substitute policies. They are complementary. Mm -hmm. So one policy, the baby bonds policy, is one that's intended to reduce the stress and strain of wealth disparities for all Americans, whereas the reparations project is one that is intended to correct for the immense imbalance of wealth that exists between blacks and whites, and you need to introduce both of them. Uh, but clearly, there's been more interest that's been expressed in pursuing uh, the baby bonds proposal. Um, and uh, one illustration is is legislation that Senator Cory Booker has in Congress now for uh, uh, for something that he refers to as opportunity accounts which is modeled on the baby bonds approach. Maybe one of the central differences is that his plan calibrates the amount of the trust account on the basis of family income mm -hmm. rather than family wealth. Okay. Uh, and I think that that's a decision that was made out of convenience mm -hmm. because we have better access to income information than we do to wealth information. And we would need to begin to introduce uh, different different uh, approaches to gathering data about families' resources to be able to uh, correctly measure their wealth position. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, another example is the state of Connecticut, which has adopted uh, something that is roughly the equivalent of a baby bonds proposal. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and 
and is has has been adopted. So mm -hmm. in our political environment, do you have more optimism for this to be adopted at the federal level or at the state level in particular kinds of states? And can you talk about the role of the federal government? Uh, for this this is a case, un unlike my thinking about reparations, mm -hmm. this is a case where I think that the adoption of baby bonds at the state level creates a useful uh, model mm -hmm. for the federal government. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, I anticipate that at some point, the federal government will have a program like this uh, and it will be informed by some of the programs that have been adopted at the, at the state level. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I wanna contrast that with my attitude about state and local so-called reparations. Mm -hmm. Which are very popular right now, like well, Evanston. It, it, yeah, it's, it, it, it's fascinating because people used to run away from the idea of reparations mm -hmm. and now, uh, Many towns and communities are declaring enthusiastically that they're setting up reparations plans. Uh, well, let, let me say why I have reservations about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, it's important to uh, establish what a reparations plan should look like right. that would be designed to eliminate the racial wealth gap. Right. And what do we mean by reparations? Yeah. If you could define that, please. So, so there are four components of what I think of as a reparations plan. The first is uh, establishing who's eligible mm -hmm. and the eligibility criteria that we <coughs> describe in From Here to Equality is that an individual would have to demonstrate two things. Uh, first, that uh, they have at least one ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. So essentially they would be demonstrating that they're descendants of the persons who were denied the 40 acre land grants that were promised. So that they are the descendants of the persons for whom the debt was initially uh, incurred. Okay. And then uh, the second condition is that they would have to, uh, they would have to establish that they self-identified as black, Negro, African-American or Afro-American for at least 12 years before the adoption of a reparations plan or the adoption of a study commission for reparations. Mm -hmm. So those are the two eligibility criteria. Mm -hmm. The and second- is that because, before you move on, is that yeah. because we know the fluidity of race, right? And we know that there are people who identify as white who are actually descendants of um, slaves, but if nevertheless, right. because they occupy the, the understood category of whiteness have nevertheless been able to benefit economically that's right. um, in that's some right. of the- And, so and they, should not, they should not be able to come across and say, oh, well, I have an enslaved ancestor, so I should be eligible for reparations, mm -hmm. not if they've been living as white. Right, okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. So that's why those kind of- um, uh, That's the second, that's the, the reason yeah. for the second criteria. Yeah. Okay, criteria. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the second feature of, of a reparations plan must be uh, a structure that would eliminate the racial wealth gap. Mm -hmm. And what would that require? Well, uh, we estimate that uh, uh, black Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States are about 12% of the nation's population, but possess less than 2% of the nation's wealth. Uh, and, and correspondingly, this means that the average black household has a net worth that is $840,000 less than the average white household. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, if we were to bring the black share of wealth into consistency with the black share of population, it would require an expenditure of at least $11 trillion. Mm. Now, here's why I, I get really, really frustrated with people making the claim that they're producing reparations at the state or local level. Mm -hmm. The combined budgets of all state and local governments in the United States, inclusive of everyone, mm -hmm. is less than $3.5 trillion. 
Hmm. So for them to get to the $11 trillion mark, they would have to devote their full budgets to a reparations fund for upwards of four years mm -hmm. and, and not provide any of the services to their constituencies that they are normally obligated to provide. Mm -hmm. So this is sheer insanity. Uh, it has to be the federal government that does this. And, uh, and that's the third attribute of the program. And the fourth and final is the distribution of the resources from a reparations fund should take the form of direct payments to eligible recipients. Mm -hmm. And the premise here is that that's how it has typically been done for victimized communities, whether it's the German government making payments to the victims of the Holocaust, or it's the US government making payments to Japanese Americans who were unjustly subjected to mass incarceration during World War II. Uh, that's how we normally do it. And there should be, there's no reason why it shouldn't be done in the same way uh, for, for black American descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. So you therefore have concerns, I would imagine, about programs that are reparations conversations that are more programmatically focused in terms of increasing education, skills, et cetera, as reparations programs. So you would have a fundamental critique of that because your argument is that's not how it has typically been done. It's typically been done to cash payments. Yeah. And it is not at all clear that those types of approaches will eliminate the racial wealth gap. Okay. 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 That's, that's the target. And so okay. the question is, do you have a policy package that would truly do that? Mm -hmm. And uh, let, let me take education as one illustration of, uh, you know, people frequently revert to education as the panacea for all dimensions of racial, racial inequality. But here's a statistic that I think is really compelling, that uh, black heads of household with a college degree have two thirds of the net worth of white heads of household who never finished high school. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, additional educational attainment, however desirable, and of course I think it's desirable, I'd be a hypocrite otherwise, however desirable it is, is not going to eliminate the racial wealth gap. It's not going to approximate doing that because the major factor influencing black white differences in wealth is the capacity, the different capacities of black and white households to transfer resources to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's that intergenerational transmission effect that is critical. And that's what needs to be interrupted in some substantial way by public policy. And the mm -hmm. policy that can interrupt it to such a degree that you eliminate those disparities is a program of reparations. Mm -hmm. Going back to your point about that significant gap between black college educated um, individuals and uh, white, um, you said high school diploma. Received. No, no, white no. High school yes. dropouts. High school dropouts. That despair, which is just stunning. Every time I hear that statistic, I, I it's just amazing to me. Yes. And part of what you're arguing causes that and the data show it is the asset differential, yeah. um, which is really important. And I wonder if you could comment on another dynamic that people talk about, which is um, black households sharing wealth with family members who don't have access to wealth so that the wealth transfer isn't happening intergenerationally. It's happening kind of horizontally within one generation as, you know, being a black college educated person, you're less likely than whites to have other black college, college educated family members. Can you talk about that kind of sociological dimension? Of, well, um, there's there's actually a couple of economists who have investigated that sociological dimension. Uh, and I'm thinking of the work that Derek Hamilton and Ngina Chiteji have done on mm -hmm. kin networks and mm -hmm. and uh, the obligations that uh, comparatively more affluent members of black families have to support their uh, their 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 relatives who have considerably fewer resources. Right. Uh, and so it's actually quite striking that despite the fact that black 
individuals who we might identify as being in the black middle class have greater Ken obligations, mm -hmm. that there's no significant difference in savings rates between blacks and whites at comparable mm -hmm. levels of income. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. somehow folks are providing assistance to their relatives, but also engaging in a sufficient amount of savings so that their rate of savings out of a given amount of income is similar to the rate of savings that white households are, are in, engaging in without having the same degree of kin obligations. Hmm. Interesting. And the, there's another uh, really good article about this by Mary Patillo and I think Co Colleen Heflin called Poverty in the Family that looks at this, this, um, looks at this dynamic. Um, talk. Can you talk about other racial groups as we think about wealth inequality? We often um, think about wealth and income vis-a-vis -vis the Asian American community. I wonder if you can comment on that. Um, we are thinking about the Latinx community, um, indigenous populations. Um, what are some of the things that we need to think about, take into account? Where do we need more information, more data? If you could just, you know, kind of expand and, and talk about um, racial wealth and income gaps across other racial groups and what we see there. Well, I'm going to focus on wealth differentials and what we well, know. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's important to say that the commitment to closing the racial wealth gap on uh, Kirsten Mullen and my part is really a, a focus on what we see as the material conditions that would be required for Black Americans to finally have full citizenship in the United States. Mm -hmm. so if we start thinking about the position of the Native American population, uh, it's, it's somewhat difficult to get adequate data at the national level. Uh, but if we were to look at, uh, for example, the city of Tulsa, where we conducted a survey under the National Asset Scorecard for Communities of Color project, uh, we find that there are differences in the wealth position of specific tribal communities. Hmm. And there are also differences in the wealth position of individuals who uh, identify with a particular tribe, but do not have formal tribal affiliation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there are a couple of tribes in, uh, in, in, um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and, and I'm talking now about individuals who have formal tribal affiliation whose wealth level is actually higher than that of the individuals who uh, self-identify as being a member of that tribe, but do not have a formal tribal affiliation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suspect that this is attributable to uh, historical conditions that can concern uh, access to land and also uh, to casino rights. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's there's a very complicated issue in thinking about uh, Native American wealth as to whether or not uh, individuals are on reservations, they're out of reservations, whether they have a formal tribal affiliation or they do not, and whether or not they're in a tribal community that has access to casino rights or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of these things come into play. Mm -hmm. uh, on average, Asian Americans uh, appear in these metropolitan level studies generally to have much higher levels of wealth right. than, uh, than other groups and sometimes including whites. Uh, I think that there's uh, some strong evidence that Asian American wealth fell more drastically during the course of the Great Recession and during that period of time, the uh, overall level of wealth that was experienced by Asian Americans actually fell slightly below the level of wealth of whites. Uh, but prior to the Great Recession, Asian Americans had the highest level of wealth. Uh, but this is a bit misleading because there's tremendous heterogeneity within the Asian American population. 
and the heterogeneity also is spatial. Mm -hmm. so, so, for example, the Vietnamese population in Los Angeles actually does not have a particularly high level of wealth, but the Vietnamese population based in Washington, D.C. does. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you were to look at, say, the, uh, the Hmong population or the Cambodian population, they actually are not a particularly high wealth community. Mm -hmm. uh, but in contrast, uh, there are significant levels of wealth that are held by, uh, by Japanese Americans uh, in particular and, and, uh, and East Indians mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so if we start talking about Asians collectively, uh, I think it's a bit misleading mm -hmm. to not disaggregate. And similarly, we need to disaggregate the Latinx community as right. well. Uh, but I would say overall, the wealth position of the Latinx community looks very similar to that of, of, of native black Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, however, even though the numbers are very much the same, the historical processes, maybe what you would want to call uh, the historical genealogy yeah. of the wealth positions of each community are quite, quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, the Latinx community does not emerge from slavery and receive a promise of 40 acre land grants that's never fulfilled. Mm -hmm. uh, the Latinx community was not... Uh, subject to, uh, is not subject, subjected to uh, the, the degree of redlining or GI Bill discrimination that uh, occurred with Blacks. Now, of course, there are uh, Afro-Latinos who are uh, confronted with the same types of discriminatory practices that uh, uh, so-called non-Hispanic Blacks face. But uh, if, if we recognize that the phenotypical variation in the Latino community provides significant insulation from that type of discrimination for a large segment of that population, then, uh, then, then, then we, we have to recognize that the conditions shaping the wealth differentials for, uh, for, for Blacks and the Latinx population are different. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to two questions. One, therefore, how do you respond to wealth de deferentials experienced by, say, the Latinx community with its diversity? And second, your response reminds me of the work that you've done on skin color and uh, the relationship between skin color and um, economic resources. So they're different questions, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to um, respond to both of them. So, uh, you know, I'm, as I said, I'm an advocate of a baby bonds proposal, which would be applicable to all Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, the notion of reparations is specific to the mm -hmm. Black American community that has ancestors who were enslaved in the United States. And that's because of the specificity of the case that we attempt to build in mm -hmm. From Here to Equality. Uh, if there are other communities that feel that they have a claim for reparations, uh, I would definitely encourage them to, you know, write a book like From Here to Equality. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not the case that we're making in our book. And so uh, I can't speak to the claims for reparations that other communities might have. But the baby bonds proposal would be applicable to everyone. Mm -hmm. And so it would also be inclusive of, uh, of the Latinx community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure there's more I can say on that. No, that makes, but, I, but, I hear what you're saying, yeah. yeah. Well, with respect to colorism, uh, you know, it's interesting. There's strong evidence that color differences within the black community are connected to differences in earnings and income. But there's not strong evidence that we found in, uh, uh, now I have to say it's only a single location, but we did a, we did a study in Los Angeles where we looked at, uh, we, we interviewed people 
but we did it in a face-to-face -face manner. Mm -hmm. And so the interviewers were able to code the individual's skin shade. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we asked folks if we could take their photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, and about half of the respondents out of about 600 gave us permission to do that. But we were then able to try to investigate what the relationship is between skin shade and earnings and what the relationship is between skin shade and wealth. And we actually did not find a significant relationship among individuals who self-identified as black. We didn't find a significant relationship between skin shade and wealth. We did find a significant relationship between skin shade and earnings. Interesting. And can you say a little bit more about that? Because as I interpret that, that means that the the physical phenotypical proximity to whiteness is actually a driver of greater access to income resources. It, it, it has an implication for what you're able to earn in terms of your phenotypical, even if you're Black, um, but have that phenotypical look, then it has implications for income. Yeah, I mean, it's consistent <laughs> with other research that, that we have done previously that suggests that the de degree of discrimination faced by uh, lighter skinned black men <coughs> is less than the degree of discrimination that's faced by darker complexion black men. Mm -hmm. So there, there is variation in that sense. Well, we don't find any significant variation with respect to wealth in the Los Angeles case, which mm -hmm. is the only location in which we've done such a study. Uh, and, and, and that's interesting uh, because it would suggest that the problem of intergenerational transmission of resources applies to virtually all black people, regardless of their phenotype. Mm. Right. Yeah. Right. So and this is also another piece of evidence that suggests that there is a, a disjuncture between income accumulation and wealth accumulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you um, help me answer some of the questions from the audience? So one question we have, and I may, um, we have a number of questions here. How have recent stimulus policies over the last, <coughs> excuse me, 19 months since From Here to Equality was published, along with the deep inequities further exposed by COVID-19 and widespread response to the murder of George Floyd, influenced and aided in the discussions about and promotion of reparations for Black Americans. Would you consider the pandemic our newest crossroads moment? Oh, that's interesting, given the crossroads that we talk about in the book. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'll have to say maybe, uh, you know, the crossroads that we identify in the book are all retrospective. Mm. And, um, you know, we'll have to see if, uh, if there's some opportunities that are lost in this particular moment, because the moment is still ongoing. Right. Um, but um, I, I will say that there, there have been two dimensions of the pandemic and the international outcry over uh, George Floyd's murder that have appeared to be uh, uh, supportive of uh, the reparations effort. The first is the, uh, the huge expenditures that the federal government has undertaken to address uh, the economic problems and crises that have been associated with the pandemic demonstrates that the federal government certainly could finance the reparations plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the experience with the pandemic is an experience that permits us to begin to tell people that they can take the how will you pay for it question off the table altogether. Mm -hmm. okay. In terms of the stimulus conversations. That's even, right. with the, yeah. even with the current um, debates happening now and the kind of, you know, last couple of holdouts on the Democratic side who have really been pushing arguments about cost and et cetera. Yeah, but they're, they're, they're wedded to a vision of fiscal finance mm -hmm. that they find politically useful, but it has no connection to reality. Okay. 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 I mean, the federal government basically 
has has spent six trillion dollars within the course of the past year, and they did so without raising taxes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm-hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. we we should we should really rethink. Right, the, it's the, opened the, up the idea of what's possible. Here. Yeah, it's yeah. really it's opened up the idea of what's possible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and then the second thing is that I think that the these tragedies have actually created a greater receptiveness to uh, to reparations. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm thinking first of the uh, the fact that in uh, in the year 2000, when Michael Dawson and Ravana Popoff did a survey of Americans. Uh, concerning their attitudes about reparations, that only 4% of white Americans endorsed monetary payments to black Americans uh, as as an act of reparative justice. Uh, In 2018, that percentage was up to 16. Still not spectacularly high, Mm -hmm. but substantially higher than 4%. Mm-hmm. And then today, the percentage appears to be about 30. Mm. Okay. So, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a sustainable momentum, but uh, things are moving in the right direction. And so, uh, you know, it gives me some sense of optimism about the future. Whether or not this is something that actually occurs in my own lifetime it seems like uh, the direction is is quite different from what it was, uh, say, only uh, four or five years ago. Mm, okay, interesting. Our next question, Dr. Darity discussed the land provision as a social provision given to mostly white individuals. Can he talk more about how policy has prevented black people and other people of color from ownership? A generational wealth building through similar tactics. Does he anticipate a growth and success of shared ownership, cooperative ownership development, and community land trusts as a mechanism to build wealth for low-income people of color? <clears throat> well, now I, I'm I'm thinking that you get rid of the wealth gap by getting rid of the wealth gap. Mm-hmm. So uh, you're going to increase the wealth position of all Black Americans by giving them an allocation that would create a situation in which the average level of black wealth would be equivalent to the average level of white wealth in the United States. Uh, So, you know, other kinds of strategies are indirect. Now, if individuals want to form land trust or cooperative arrangements and make use of the funds that they receive uh, from reparations payments, then by all means do so. Uh, you know, we've got we've got some folks who are who are saying that they want to uh, repatriate to the continent. Uh, well, if they want to use their reparations funds to do that, then they should be able to do that. But I think it it has to be a matter of discretion for each of the eligible recipients what's mm-hmm. done with the funds. So if this if this particular individual wants to organize a cooperative. Uh, with uh, a group of similarly resourced Black Americans, uh, you know, a reparations program would give people the opportunity to do that uh, mm-hmm. because they would have a very different set of options uh, with a, a significantly higher level of wealth. Mm-hmm. And you know what I read also into this question, what it made me think about is we've talked about places where public policy has been active in bolstering the wealth of whites proactively and restricting that access to blacks um, and and in some cases other people of color. But we also have to note the ways in which the federal government has not provided legal protections when wealth was built um, by blacks. And I wonder if you can talk about instances in which public policy did not respond to the detriment of wealth building. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, we know the the, the very well-known example now of, of, of Oklahoma right. and kind of Black Wall Street. But I wonder if you can talk about how public policy has at some point, you know, removed itself or refused to enforce equal justice under the law or um, refused to create um, remedies when massive wealth stealing has happened. 
Can you talk a little bit about that role for public policy? <clears throat> well, you know, the federal government has effectively sanctioned upwards of 100 massacres that took place from the end of the Civil War into World War II. Uh, white massacres that took black lives and either destroyed or resulted in the seizure of black owned property by the white terrorists. And so, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921 is, is a single illustration mm -hmm. of a pattern of, of, of white violence that was intended to prevent blacks from participating in the political process, but also uh, intended to, uh, to make it possible for whites to, uh, to, to take possession of, 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 their, of the property that they had, had won in a hard earned fashion. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yes, I mean, there is an issue of uh, whether or not property would be protected. I mean, if we go back to the aftermath of the Civil War and the whole issue surrounding the land reform and 40 acres, had that land actually been allocated, it would have been essential for the Union Army to remain in the South for at least a full generation and or arm Blacks so that they could protect themselves from the predations of the white terrorists. In effect, uh, if you had made that land allocation, it would have been essential to protect that land allocation. Uh, and I would say similarly, if we had a reparations plan in the United States in the modern era, um, we would have to be prepared for the fact that there's going to be 30% of the population that will be so resistant to any policy that substantially improves the condition of black Americans that they may resort to violence. And so preparations would have to be made to anticipate that type of behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it is interesting that there was a tremendous amount of information out there that signaled that there was going to be an attempted coup d'etat in, in, in Washington on January 6th, but, uh, but it was largely ignored. Uh, and, and similarly, we have evidence that there was extensive preparation for the Tulsa massacre. There was extensive preparation underway for the Wilmington massacre in North Carolina of 1898. Uh, in the Wilmington case, according to David Zucchino, efforts were made to get uh, the state's governor, as well as as the uh, as as the president, President McKinley, to take steps to prevent that event from taking place, and and no one bothered. So there was a a sanction by inaction ultimately. Mm. Mm -hmm. Sanction by inaction. That's key. That's key for policy discussions. And it's, it's an important concept to kind of lift up. OK, next question. To what extent are reparations to black Americans a global issue or to blacks, I would say, a global issue? Are there other examples of successful restitutions across the globe or could the U.S. set an example for other previously slave owning countries to follow? And we might we might argue colonizing countries as well. Um, why hasn't the UN intervened in American affairs since becoming aware of this issue? So to me, this argument is also about, you know, thinking about responding to colonialism as well. So talk to us about kind of the global case or your ideas about the global case for reparations. <clears throat> well, well, the UN actually has had a, a task force that has, uh, has recommended reparations in the United States. So, uh, but, but that's all they can do. I mean, they don't have the capacity to compel any individual government to do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but they, they, they are attempting to use the force of moral suasion mm -hmm. uh, in, in support of reparations. So, uh, so that's, that's the most the UN can actually do, uh, but it, it's, it's been done. Uh, with respect to the question of uh, diaspora-wide reparations, in the work that, that Kirsten and I've done, we've focused on the notion that uh, individual communities within the diaspora should make claims on the appropriate uh, perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And so in the context of the United States, we think that uh, the, the debt that is owed is embodied in the failure to provide the 40 acres 
And that creates the foundation for the case for reparations that black Americans who are descendants of US slavery have with the US government. But in parallel fashion, uh, the Congo has uh, a compelling case to be made against Belgium. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, countries of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the former British colonies like uh, Trinidad and Tobago or Jamaica have a case against the United Kingdom. Uh, the Haitians have a case against France uh, they have a powerful case against France because France compelled Haiti to pay reparations to them. Right. You know, right. which is, <clears throat> is just incredible. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, 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 I know of no instance where uh, countries where slavery was practiced have received reparations from the nations that perpetrated their enslavement. Mm. Okay. Uh, now, we do have this peculiar instance where after more than a century, uh, despite the fact that this country paid reparations to victims of the Holocaust, finally, for more than a, after more than a century, Germany says, it's going to do something on behalf of the Nama and the Herero people in Southern Africa who were subjected to genocidal violence by the Germans. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I think that the, the Nama and the Herero people are not satisfied with the offer mm -hmm. that Germany is putting forward. But if that were to occur, I think that would be the very first instance of reparations of some form, inadequate though it may be, mm -hmm. being made for colonial oppression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you, what made the <clears throat> the cases that were successfully executed for reparations distinct from the case for Black Americans, Nazi Germany, um, the reparations paid to Japanese Americans? What made those cases distinct such that those groups, that their victims did receive the internment of Japanese Americans and then um, yeah. what happened in Nazi Germany? What made those cases successful in terms of the case for reparations? So it's interesting to know that in the case of Germany, and now we're specifically talking about West Germany, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I think less than 20% of the German population actually was in favor of reparations for the victims of the Holocaust. Mm. But it happened anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the major reasons that happened was because the, uh, the German government agreed to engage in negotiations with Israel because they recognized that taking this step would permit them to re-enter uh, the community of nations as a legitimate part partner. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, they, they were in a position of ostracization and they wanted to get past that. It's also interesting to note that they did make monetary payments, but they have never made a formal apology. Mm. Mm. Uh, so it's fairly clear that this was a reparations plan that was adopted without passion and enthusiasm on the part of most Germans. Mm -hmm. uh, so the why I think is simply because the, of the practicalities of international politics from the standpoint of Germany's leadership in the immediate aftermath of the war. Uh, what about uh, Japanese Americans receiving reparations payments from the US government? Well, the Japanese American case is an interesting one, uh, both in terms of certain dimensions of, uh, of serendipity, uh, but also in terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of the effort that the Japanese American community themselves made. Uh, they undertook a powerful lobbying effort to receive some form of reparative justice and they had to come up to an agreement uh, that was not uniformly held, 
that a component or a part of the reparations uh, agreement would have to include uh, monetary payments. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a there was a dispute within the Japanese American community over that, uh, just as uh, there was a dispute in the Jewish American community over whether or not they were going to uh, to seek monetary payments. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but in the case of the Japanese Americans, they received an apology and they received monetary payments. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, uh, but I, I think this was a consequence of, of uh, the intensity of the uh, lobbying effort that they undertook. And also the fact that uh, there was a, uh, a, a Republican Senator and a Democratic Party representative who was Japanese, who were strong friends uh, while the, uh, the, the, the Japanese American representative was in, uh, in, incarcerated with his family, hmm. uh, he became close friends with the Republican Senator through a Boy Scout Jamboree. Hmm. And yes. so they collaborated across party lines to support, uh, uh, the, the Japanese American reparations project. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that that's serendipity from the standpoint of what made it possible. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but, Your proposal for reparations is very much about the role of government and it goes back to that original broken policy promise around 40 acres. But I wonder when you think about the role of the private sector, when you think about the, the wealth that was gained by corporations, when you know, you've seen conversations among colleges and universities, Georgetown being one, around universities that were built on the labor of slaves and thinking about some form of reparations through um, tuition benefits, et cetera. Do you not, would you not call those that's reparations? Hard reparations. <laughs> that's something else, right. That's something else that are also, trying to respond to yeah. some economic inequities, but you would not call that reparations. It sounds yeah. like you reserve that term for, a, you have a very clear specificity around your use of that term. Yeah, I, I think that we have to be pr proprietary about the term and we have to uh, limit it in the context of, of uh, reparations for black American descendants of US slavery to mm -hmm. elimination of the racial wealth gap, which is a product of historical policies that produce that type of disparity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, uh, college scholarships are not going to eliminate the racial wealth gap. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that's that's somewhat different from the question as to whether or not private individuals or organizations or, or state and local governments, for that matter, should be involved in financing reparations or funding reparations. And, uh, I certainly don't have any aversion to them supplementing a federal reparations fund with additional resources, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's, it, it, it would be very difficult to compel them to do so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it would be very difficult to compel them to do so is that most of the actions and practices they undertook, especially during the period of enslavement, uh, were legal. Right. Yeah. Within that context. It's right. Like highly immoral, but they were legal. Mm -hmm. And so if we were going to address the question of who is responsible for the legality of those immoral practices, mm -hmm. we have to turn back to the federal government again. And that's why we say that the federal government is the culpable party. But it's also the capable party because only the federal government has the capacity to amass the types of resources that can really uh, penetrate and eliminate the racial wealth gap. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sandy, at the Ford School, we've been engaged in conversations as a faculty, just to switch gears a little bit towards our last question about what anti-racist teaching looks like. 
and diversifying what we teach and how we teach broadly, um, particularly within a school of public policy, because what our conversation has so clearly demonstrated is the enormous role of public policy in um, setting the terms by which we all operate for not just our generation, but generations to come. So we've been having a conversation around what does anti-racist teaching look like, particularly in the policy school context? How do we diversify what and how we teach? How can we better educate our students um, to be thinking about these ideas as we craft our syllabi and introduce core frameworks and ideas, facilitate discussion in the classroom? What advice would you give us um, as we think about these issues? What does it mean to offer policy education in a content with a lens towards anti-racism? Wow. <laughs> Uh, I, I, that's a tough one. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, one of the big issues always when we think about this pedagogically is, is, is the question of whether or not the emphasis should be on designing new courses that have not been available previously, that have a focus on, say, race and policy or something along those lines versus, and, and, and these are not mutually exclusive strategies, but people tend to think about them as, as somewhat separate, versus uh, how you integrate the analysis of race and policy into your existing classes. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's probably good to try to do both, but I think it's maybe, uh, it, it may be a richer experience for the students to have new class opportunities that are taught by people who are deeply experts in that area. Uh, I think it's really, really hard for faculty members uh, who have not really studied this issue to just inject a module into their class and expect that to be uh, something that's effective and, and sufficient. So, uh, you know, un unless they undergo not sensitivity training, but research experience in the area so that they'll truly be knowledgeable about the subject matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so I guess I lean more in the direction of, you know, developing new curricular offerings mm -hmm. and and uh, and hiring new faculty members who have expertise in those areas. Uh, to the extent that you you may not already have an adequate complement of faculty members who can do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dr. Sandy Darity, thank you so much. This was such an informative discussion, so rich in terms of its historical context and discussion of policy genealogies and the current state of the data and how we can bring all that together. Um, to grapple with some really important ideas. Thank you so much for your research career, your authorship of so many different um, important ideas in the fields of policy studies and um, econ, but I should also add sociology, former president of the Association of Black Sociologists. You've been everywhere. So thank you so much for contributing to this Racial Foundations of Public Policy series. Thank you so much to our audience for joining us today in this conversation. And we encourage you to join us next time with Dr. Uh, Rucker Johnson, who will be with us on October 26th. Sandy, Dr. Darity, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I've been honored to join you. It's a great series. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. Thank you. Good, good evening, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.